So, um, for me, a picture of the world is, begins with a self-portrait in a way, and this is a self-portrait of the Rux Media Collective, of the three people in it. A donkey crossing the road to somewhere or nowhere, uh, a shadow of a, of a person taking a picture, and a person taking a measure of the distance. The roles between the three of us keep changing. Sometimes I am the donkey, sometimes it's Monica, sometimes it's Jibesh. Uh, that's the three of us, and we're constantly having this conversation for the last 23 years. One day we decided to map this conversation, so we took our three computers, which we place in our studio on a table, and we decided to map the traffic between our computers and the world. And this is what we get. This is the kind of traffic. It's a picture of the traffic between our uh, computers on a particular summer afternoon. And what it creates is this kind of strange triangulation between ourselves, between ourselves and the world, and between ourselves and the memories of our practice. You could say that this triangulation also is a kind of meshwork, constant relaying of messages and ideas, and a kind of, let's say, signal in the middle of a lot of noise between anybody, somebody, everybody, antibodies. So we see the fact that worlds get made the moment you have these kinds of conversations. And that's what I've been trying to do in the last two days with the young people who came to be a part of Green Light here, this project that Olafur Eliasson has initiated to try and create a space for light in the middle of a conversation. Just as the workshop ended today, one of the people who spoke said something quite remarkable. We were discussing many Im interesting and important ideas, amongst which was the question of freedom or liberty, which is one of the reasons why these young people have, have had these tremendously difficult journeys to be able to experience what they think is freedom in your city. And this young man called Larabi from Western Morocco said that freedom was like a little bit of light in a very dark room which showed you the way, if there was one, to the door and the distance between you and the other people around you. And it's for me and trying to understand a place in the world that's always at the heart of our practice. And that place in the world can take us from here to the infinite extensions of the current moment and, and, our, and, and our anchorage within it. Uh, so a lot of our work tries to address this question of infinitude. Today, while we were doing our workshop, other young people, the same age as these young people in this room, were again pursuing the practice of liberty in my city, in Delhi, where students especially are being attacked by an extremely repressive government. They are being put into prison. They're being suspended from the universities. They're being harassed in all sorts of ways. So thousands of students for the past few weeks have been coming out at regular intervals in Delhi and other cities, trying to find that small patch of light in what is beginning to be a very dark room. And as you can see, what they say is that we fight for the beauty of our dreams. So I said that this presentation is going to be about finding a, a space within a very turbulent world. So while I was walking and having these conversations with the young people here, my mind was also with my young friends in Delhi who were holding up these signs. So in a sense, I was trying to inhabit both these places in the world at the same time. What does it mean to inhabit the world? What does it mean to be in more than one place in the world? What does it mean to be distributed? What does it mean to be present to time and space? This is a work by us. I'm not going to be showing you so many works by us today because I think that's not such an interesting and important thing to do. You can always find out more about our work. But I'm trying to speak a few ideas. So this is a work about time and place. It's called Escapement, which is what happens in watches or mechanical contraptions of time, which let go of the minute hand and then release it and then let catch it and then release it. That's why it's called letting it escape, the escapement. So escapement is a constellation of clocks which could describe any moment of time in the world. 
except that the hours are read not as numbers, but as states of feeling or emotion. So you can always be between ecstasy and epiphany, or fatigue and anxiety, or indifference and awe. And if you look at this work, it's distributed over 24, 27 stations, 24 for each hour of the day, each of which is a particular combination of latitude and longitude, a particular time zone, so that if it is, let's say, ecstasy past indifference in Vienna, it may be fatigue past anxiety in my home in Delhi. How does one create a sense of the world where all these feelings are played out simultaneously, where students in Delhi hold up a sign that says, we fight for the freedom of our dreams, a young man of the same age in a room in Vienna remembers having the last cup of coffee in Afghanistan before he left on this long and difficult journey that brought him to Vienna. How do we produce relationships of feeling and reason and understanding between these distributed moments in time? How do we work across languages? While we were working in the last two days, we realized that having a difficulty of understanding each other, talking between Farsi, Dari, Arabic, Kurdish, English, German, was not a problem, but was an opportunity for us to really try and understand different worlds. So I'm trying to constantly work with translation itself, and I've often said that translation is our mother tongue. Even in Rux, we speak more than one language, and we have to constantly translate our experiences to each other as a way of thinking about the world. Which means that we always end up being strangers. So I'm giving you another sense of a small work, which is uh, a threefold examination of three bodies of poetry, each one about being a stranger from Agha Shahid Ali, a poet from Kashmir, Rabindranath Tagore, a poet who wrote in the Bengali language, which is my mother tongue, and Faiz Ahmed Faiz, a poet who has a great readership between India and Pakistan, who wrote in Urdu. And each one of these is a, is a, is a kind of ode to a stranger. When you hold up the work, you have to read between languages. You have to find someone who helps you to translate, and each language becomes a shadow on another language, on another utterance. So what is it that we see when we see each other as strangers? And remember, the presence of migrants in your society is an opportunity for each one of us to discover ourselves as strangers in relation to others. These were some of the tenor of the conversations that we were having yesterday and today. The same work then travels in another register between two other difficult languages, Hebrew and Arabic, between bodies of poetry between Mahmoud Darwish, whose birthday, incidentally, it is today, and another great poet, um, Yehuda Amachai, who wrote in Hebrew, and the two men were friends. This is a work by us that takes into account their two bodies of poetry, creates a kind of set of instructions for reading Darvesh and Amechai together, as if they were in conversation with each other, produces an architecture to house that reading, and then produces an occasion where that reading can be done by an Arabic-speaking woman and a Hebrew-speaking man who read to each other, not in Arabic, not in Hebrew, but in the language of, of imperfect translation, which in this case is English. So we take 121 pages of a book of poems by Darvesh in English, 121 pages of a book by Amechai in English, and read one by one, line by line, the poems and see what happens between them. It's this kind of conversation that I was trying to achieve with our participants um, in yesterday and today. And it's not always a conversation that is had with ease. We talked about oranges, we talked about the scent of fruit, we talked about memories of home, here is another work called The Fruits of Labor by Us, which simply produces an orchard of orange trees in a factory in response to a call in a worker's newspaper to turn factories into orchards, to turn gardens into, to turn spaces of labor into the spaces of repose and relaxation. And these memories or prophecies can then become the subject of very ordinary, but at the same time magical conversations about very, very big words like Dunya, the world, which was the name of one of our participants. Khoriyat, or freedom, or azadi, which is an ideal that many of these young people have walked the world for. And 
hope or amal, the future, mustaqbil in, in Arabic. So we produced small conversations around these words so that people could actually speak to each other across the historical and cultural differences that they have. This is the same work iterated in another sense. Many factories transformed into many kinds of orchards. And then another work with trees and forests and gardens, which asks what would happen if the world were a fair place. This is an iteration of a sculptural work in uh, St. Louis in the American South, where there's been a huge history of racial tension. And we asked the citizens of this town where there had once been a world fair to ask the question, what would, be it, what would it be like if the world were a fair place? To take the idea of the world fair and turn it around through some, a little bit of wordplay into, into a question of what happens when justice is imagined in the world. And they came up with ideas and slogans which then became bracelets and, and armbands for trees in the forest around, a sculpture garden around an exhibition space. Another way of thinking about the world, more salt in your tears. I show this work because again, in the conversations that I was having in this next room, we were talking often about happiness, sadness, tears, and laughter. And that particular work had something to do with tears because it's actually a picture of the world. As long as the Baltic Sea in the north of Europe has a salinity just a little less than human tears, we have global warming staved off. It's an index of climatic conditions and environmental conditions which say that as long as the Baltic Sea's salinity is less than human tears, we're in a safe place in the world. The moment that shifts, there will be uh, many disasters and catastrophes. So it makes us think about the world in terms of a map of emotions again. So I leave you with a, with a sound with a song, again from the streets of Delhi. What does it mean to think about happiness and freedom? Here is um, one of these students' speeches in a university turned into a dance track. And we spent day before yesterday listening to a lot of music that the young people had brought, a kind of music that they never liked to dance to because I was like a party. So this is a, this is a, this is a dance track. They're asking for freedom, azadi, from many kinds of oppression, from patriarchy, from capitalism, from fascism, all kinds of oppression that, that sit heavily upon these young people. Freedom, with these young people was because of this remarkable facility 
that this generation has of producing meaning almost instantly. You, sh you have a conversation, you upload it, you record it, you upload it, you transform it, you add a music track to it, and you immediately have a meme that goes, passes from phone to phone, from hand to hand, from consciousness to consciousness. And so we were trying what, what we can do together with just phones in our hands and the thoughts in our head and the conversations we were having. So here was the result of, I want to sh share with you a few uh, of the results of today. So this is what we were doing, for instance. Here is a young man who, um, whose name in Farsi means the rain, which I liked very much, that you can be called the rain. And this is what he decided to talk about in the morning. And each of these were trying out sort of stances and positions of how do we think about the world. Hello, Privet, Namaste, Assalamu alaikum. Hello, my name is Tawa, and my family name is Boran. And today I want to speak about the future. I hope that you all accept it. <coughs> As we are all know that the meaning of the world of future, that future is future, and now is now. So future is for those persons that dear to their best now. And we must do our best now that we make our future bright. So in short sentence, I want to tell the meaning of future that uh, no one knows that uh, in the future what's happening. So we must do our best now. We don't think about future. When those person do their best now, their future is bright. In the short sentence, I want to end that speaks or conversation that uh, dear past thanks for all the lessons on dear future I'm ready thank you so much or for instance let's listen to another one hello ich heiße Kassel Assalamu alaikum, Madhusa, Manham, Barre, Amikimaga, Yad Safari, Ochil Safarsh, Yad Safari, My name is Qasim, Qasim Ali, I come from Kabul in Afghanistan, and I don't have too many memories. My memories consist of what was for me, what I spoke about yesterday, and what I will speak about today again which is that there are three things I know. One is fire, the other is blood, and the third is war. These are the three things I have lived with all my life, and this is what constitutes the past. However, now I have made my way up through thousands of miles in a truck that took me from Iran, from Afghanistan to Iran, from Iran to Pakistan, from Pakistan to Iran again, from Iran to Turkey, from Turkey to Syria, from Syria to Greece to Macedonia, and then to Austria. And here I came, and I have been here for seven months, and now I'm learning German, and that is for me the future. Because that is not war, that is not fire, and that is not blood. So I think that this, in this very simple way, this young man was able to actually encapsulate the story of his entire past few years. Not just the years of his life, but also the history of the country that he has come from. In each of these conversations, we were trying to achieve something very simple. They all spoke about the fact that at the border, at any border, when they, when they, first, encounter, when they first encounter the authorities, they are not treated as, hu as individuals, but as numbers. So we were saying that these small testimonies by uploading onto YouTube become traces of the human beings that we are. Everyone has a particular story of, like we said, the last cup of tea or the last cup of coffee. And it is with that particularity that we're able to find the resources for understanding that we are not just numbers and not just statistics. So here is, for instance, the beginning of an effort to tell a story. Different meaning. Yeah. So he's saying, I am making an effort to speak to the whole world, to the entire dunya. 
And this is my effort, and that is what I'm trying to do in what I'm going to say to you. Let me end with a fragment of two other little videos. لأي فرد أيا كانت جنسيته ثقافته قوميته عرقه لونه أو حتى انتماءه الديني والحرية أيضا هي التخلص من كافة أنواع القيود والعوائق التي تقف في وجه الإنسان وتجعله غير قادر على أن يكون إنسانا منتجا إنسانا فعالا تجعله غير قادر على what I found most remarkable in what he said was that freedom for him is the opportunity to stop and think before saying something, not having to immediately give an answer. Freedom is that pause, that moment of relaxation between one breath and another. He's from Syria. He's quite a talented person who had a career as a as a as an illustrator, as an animator in films, and he has a particular fondness, as he said, for creating things for children. And he's often thought that his work lay between the frames, between the making of movements in a video. This is Larabi, who worked in a factory. Again, talking about what is freedom. الحرية صار لي تقريبا خمس شهور أو ما بعرف خمس شهور وشوي بالضبط اللي تحصلت عليها تقريبا توقت عليها لأنه أنا أسمع الحرية ما بعرف الحرية كيف عاملة وكيف دائرة فالحرية هي غالية الثمن غالية كثير يعني في ناس تدفع تقريبا ملايين دولارات لتحصل على الحرية وما تنالها وأنا ف... وأنا بظن نفسي بأني محظوظ تحصلت على الحرية بالمجان. So he's the one who said freedom is the small, quiet light in a darkening room that allows us to see the way to the door. I want to end by sharing a, a remarkable encounter that I once had in Italy where a woman gave me a set of papers which were taken from the jeans or trousers of a person who nobody knew who they were, but the genes were found in one of these boats that come across the Mediterranean. And these folded papers were actually a dictionary, a lexicon of the kind of things that the person who wore these genes might consider necessary in the new world that they were coming to. They happened to be in my language, Bengali, so I could read them, and nobody else really could. And so I suddenly encountered this lexicon or dictionary of a person's imagined life. And they included words like bread, water, toilet, food, all the things that they might find necessary. What is the way to the post office? Uh, can you show me a photograph? Things like that. But also words like the universe, galaxies, stars, star system, love, regret passion and freedom. I, very, I was very struck by the fact that this lexicon of words which included bread and galaxies was found in the, in the abandoned pocket of a genes of a migrant who may have made it to land or may have drowned at sea. But within, but within that resource of creating a new language was I think again that small light which is a door towards finding a way towards freedom. Thank you very much. This is my way of having a conversation with what I had with the young people who were here and my effort to transmit a little bit of that conversation to you. Thank you.
it's this. For me, uh, for, for us, it's conversation. Because, uh, if, I mean, we started by working a lot with uh, the internet and digital media and so on and so forth, but we realized that our real interest was not so much in the technological means that made communication possible, but communication itself, conversation itself. So nowadays I'm coming around to an understanding that the medium or the, or the genre in which we work is actually conversation. If that answers your question. Yes. Uh, this is, I have a second one. Yeah. Uh, conversation is, is, a, is, a, is a very precarious word. Because it's, it, if you analyze it from like a Latin, it's called ethics. So it's goes with and against. Against, yes. So basically, is it about exchange or is it about polemics? Well, the advantage of working in a collective like ours is that we can disagree with each other over 23 years. And we, we have continued to disagree with each other. So the verse is as much a part of it as the con. But what's also interesting in any conversation is the space of silence and listening. Because I've really come to understand, and I think you, uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with me that the real substance of the work that we were doing in that room was not so much to do with speech as it was to do with listening. It was to listen across and between languages. It was to have patience, and we talked about patience, about the patience to try and understand something. And while I am absolutely clear that we need to have polemics all the time and we need to disagree, it's listening that is for me is the transformative experience. It sometimes turns a disagreement into an agreement, or it sometimes leads me to examine the consensuses that we had before and realize that actually we don't agree with them anymore. So between different speech acts, the spaces of silence and the spaces of attention for me are, for us, are as important as the speech themselves. Because I, I was thinking very much about the label of shoes is called converse. Right, yeah. And why it's so popular in terms of work. Yeah. Conversation and conversion are basically hand in hand. Great. Absolutely. Question? You want it? I wanted to ask, I was also not privy to the whole workshop, but just for a little while today, one of the things that you kind of reiterated and I think to some extent began to talk was this idea of a presentation, right? So taking your story, taking their stories, and you're really out of the belt and encouraging them to kind of put that out in various channels or whatever. Um, I guess I just wanted to, if you could expand a little bit on what, yeah. why, and also like, not necessarily in a directly critical way, but I just also think that there's, Within various media platforms, there's also a question of accessibility to who has access to this, which you're saying that they, they now do, but <coughs> a lot of people don't. And also, there's agendas that are attached to certain platforms. I was just wondering if, if that was something that you thought a about. Yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in the telling of stories by all means possible by all and any means possible. Because as we discussed yesterday um, in the workshop, and I open by asking the question, when you set out on your voyage, what did you have with you? And it's quite true, as we discovered, and as I know, as was confirmed to me, that the young people who make these kind of journeys do not carry bags with them, because you can't afford to be weighed down by, by the things you carry. You basically have a suit of clothes, uh, some sugar sometimes, a few nuts maybe, which last you for a little while, but actually you don't carry anything. So what do you carry? And we realize that what people carry in, in these passages, in these long journeys, are basically what they carry and what they gather are stories and memories. And what is the currency of travel, how you actually are able to find in, in storytelling is in these situations a vital survival skill. Because you can actually, and I think that we understood this quite clearly, that all these young people have tremendous amounts of personal charisma. Because that is actually something that helps them survive. 
It's the interaction with, let's say, a bodyguard where the ability to tell a moving and passionate story is the difference between being deported and not being deported. So I was working with that, with the, with that currency, with the idea that the telling of stories and the presentation of self, which is something that they know unconsciously, is also something that can allow us to, to have a kind of reflection on what, it, what happens when, when people who are very vulnerable meet people who are very powerful. And sometimes it's that presentation of the self that mediates between power and vulnerability. And then we talked about the fact that in the face of erasure, in the face of being made impersonal, the only imprint that one can leave in the world is through this kind of circulation of subjectivity. We're all very aware of the fact that, let's say, YouTube or Facebook or these are all compromised platforms. I'm not at all unaware of that fact. But what, what interests me is the fact that for millions of people, that is not as important as the ability to tell the story, to create this kind of ongoing archive of human subjectivity. Uh, I am very conscious of the fact that right now in India, for instance, one of the big problems facing the kind of political organizing that young people are doing is of surveillance online, because every trace is being looked at and examined. But on the other hand, these are also the conditions in which we are talking about the political activity of millions of people, not of a select elite of uh, you know, people who actually make decisions, whose decisions have consequences. But there is a way in which the, the daily, hourly activity of thousands of young people actually also defeats the purposes of censorship or defeats the purposes of surveillance because it defeats it by sheer volume. And that's one of the ways in which I understand the tension between power and vulnerability to lie in. That the only strength we have is actually a strength in numbers. And it's possible to use that to overwhelm the processing abilities of power. So that's why I'm quite keen that people sort of put themselves online. That as many of these strange, even the culture of the selfie, because these were basically extended selfies. There were selfies as gifts in which an 18-year-old person talked about their dreams of freedom. It's not more than that. But I think that that creates certain conditions of confidence in the person who makes that utterance. And that's what I'm interested in. Well, well, I think that the, the way to think about differences is to, is to think about obstructions uh, and to think about, let's say, the old idea of the relation between signal and noise. What kind of technical support leads to how many obstructions in the, in the carrying of a, of a signal? Um, what kind of genre allows itself to be mediated through which kind of technical support. A conversational medium is, is I mean, for me, what's really interesting is the ability of, the, let's say, these devices, let's say a phone, to be something that is held in the hand, so that it passes, maybe, as a, as a tool of recording from one hand to another hand to another hand. That already, for me, that, that transference that is from hand to hand already produces certain properties of how people see themselves being referenced and reproduced in these signals. So between the, let's say, the genre of the interview, it's a dramatic genre in which one person asks questions and the other answers, or in the question of the self-interview, where, where a person asks questions to themselves and answers. And it's often something that comes it comes in tandem with this idea that we are actually speaking into a, 
into a device that is recording something of our substance. Now, there are technical possibilities in that situation in terms of how loudly or how softly we speak. So there is a, there is a mode of, let's say, intimate speech that can actually become quite interesting, which is not polemical, which is not oratorical, but is really intimate. And I think that it's these, these possibilities that we need to think about very carefully. How can intimate personal speech become, um, take on the status of a political slogan when it passes from hand? Well, language becomes technical support, for instance, whenever we think about translation. There's the technical facility or the technical ease of being able to negotiate between the syntaxes of different languages. What I'm interested in is that many of these people come from extremely sophisticated linguistic cultures, where speech, speech making, poetry, is not seen as something very distant or even, um, how should I say, it's out of the reach of the experience of a common person. I mean, I think we were all, I was not, but I, I could see in the room a certain surprise at the ease with which people sl slipped into metaphorical and poetic speech. But these are highly developed linguistic cultures, Arabic, Persian, Kurdish, uh, you know, poetry is the highest technological achievements of these cultures, in a sense. And these young people carry that with them. So in that sense, the, the let's say, prosody, the ability to speak a certain kind of metered speech. I could recognize that in one of the, the speeches that was made. And they were all making these statements as forms of speech. They were actually using the, technolo the technologies of, of a certain kind of prose and poetry. So for me, that's also a kind of embodied technical support, if you like. Yeah, but also, it's something that you embody. Because you create the form. Mm -hmm. I think that you not only use it for technical support or a medium or a genre, but in connecting these entities, you are interested to create a static form. So, and you do that through embodiment and you do that through a very direct action. I think, of course, it makes a difference if you recover it or not. But that's almost the next step that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. About form. Yeah, you create, you also create form as a fluid, as a fluent kind of entire. I think that, I think that I'm, 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 in a sense, addressing also the memory of the fact that this gesture of sitting, of a lot of people sitting and talking through time, a kind of effortless speech which is not purposeful. Nobody has a presentation to make, but everyone is speaking and in silence in turns, is I know that we're losing it in India because every time I speak, I have to have a reason to speak. But this kind of a, a democratic culture of the salon, in a sense, not the high bourgeois salon, but the kind of gathering in which, let's say, women sit around stitching or cutting onions and telling each other stories, or men sit around with the shisha and tell stories, or children and adults sit at one table and talk or are silent together for a very long time and then talk and then are silent is something that we tend to miss out in many metropolitan contexts where all speech acts are take this form where someone makes a presentation then there's a question and answer and then we you know there's a kind of encoded formality to the to the very acts of speech making 
But I think it's interesting to actually go back to histories of a different kind of conversational practice. Yes. Even now, I think it's fast forward again because now we don't have this uh, conversation that we're talking about. I think we have no more uh, conversation we would relate to the bourgeois Yeah. So what, what's, what's happening in, in these trends? My hope is that with the presence of more and more people from Afghanistan, Kurdistan, and Syria in your cities, you, we will all learn how to go back to those conversational forms. That their presence as bodies will actually create the conditions for the renewal of a memory of conversation. If cities such as Vienna and Berlin and London acquire the necessary patience to be able to do that. But then that's maybe the task of cultural institutions such as this one, is to create those islands of patience where we rediscover a new mode of listening and speaking, maybe. It makes me want to get out of this table and sit with you over there immediately. And I think that we really should find ways of, in fact, doing that. I mean, why am I even sitting here? <laughs> we can sit and have a much easier conversation uh, like this, no? I mean, it's easier. Because then, then we are really redrawing the rules of how we do these things. That's what's more necessary and important, rather than... But, so he has to redraw too. I mean, I think that's what we did in those last two days, was very much in this mode. And how do we create, a, how do we create an ethics of conversation where we can make these transfers possible? That's, for me, the role of the imagination, the role of art in politics is to do that, is to create new, new modes of listening, even if not new modes of speech. What I, what I really admire is the fact that he was also having these conversations with himself. So it isn't just what he was talking about, it was always a question of leaving a trace of what was on his table. So these boxes that are the accumulation of what was on his table. For instance, I use, let's say, I use Facebook like that. I use Facebook as a record, as a journal of all the things that I am reading, thinking about, the conversations that I'm having. It's not really, for me, a mode of expressing myself, because it's not where I express myself, but it's where I learn to remember what I'm thinking. 
And so in that sense, it is a recording machine, and I don't know if I'm married to it or if I'm just having a very, very complicated affair with it. <laughs> yeah, it stat the whatever it is that thing, this relationship status with one's. It could be that, but I, although I doubt that anyone will find what we are doing, what I'm doing on Facebook, very useful. <laughs> hmm. But that's Andy Warhol. That's not me. Yeah. Yeah. I think he inaugurates or is the site of the inauguration of many new forms of encoded subjectivity that, that are then, that have a very close relationship to the to the traffic of images and thoughts. So uh, I don't see him as not being, I don't see that sensibility as not being implicated in a certain highly volatile and, and um, speedy form of the generation of a new capitalism of images. But it may be also interesting to think of how one slows things down. How does one create modes of speech, conversation, circulation that actually intensify our immersion into the present moment? Not dispersal, but a sort of thickened presence, a way of being thickened into the world. We talked for a while about today with the young people about the fact that one of the things that they do have an advantage in is that they have a lot of time, quite differently from the way we have time, because a lot of their days are spent in waiting and in anticipation, because they're forced out of being useful, you know? They can't be useful in this social realm because that is the one thing that this society really is afraid of, that these people will end up being useful. So they have a kind of really enforced leisure which all captives have. So how to, how to take advantage of that enforced leisure to actually produce a mode of life of inhabiting the present which is deeply philosophical? which I think they all are beginning to be. So how do you create a kind of practice of philosophical conversation quite remarkably on ideas such as the future, freedom, life, love, friendship, solidarity? These are all big questions between a group of, between these accidental uh, accidental solidarities of young people who are happen to be living in one house because they're all waiting to hear about their status. Now, there may be acts of recording, acts of inscription, acts of placing traces on each other that may obey a completely different logic of the accumulation of traces from the neoliberal impetus that we are discussing. It may be. I mean, I'm, I'm always struck by the fact that something is going on in the world right now which makes for a greater depth in certain conversations.
maybe that's a nice moment to <laughs> to find a little bit of silence again and you can watch the film or something okay the film is called the surface of each day is a different planet and it's an effort to think about crowds of different kinds crowds within images crowds in history gatherings of people of all different sorts of kinds when the request to show a film came up we were a bit um, worried about what to show but this is a film that can be seen in one screen a lot of our moving image work actually takes more than one screen and it has detailed has complicated installation specifics whereas this can be seen as a single screen work um, please do see the film and i'm happy to talk about it afterwards Thank you for letting me come from outside of this table.